What's up guys, welcome to my launch review video for these new long-awaited Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. I have the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 3700X and the 12-core 24-thread Ryzen 9 3900X here today. I have a whole bunch of benchmarks to share with you guys. Speaking of benchmarks though, my mind is pretty much mush from running so many for this past week, so I really hope you guys find them useful. And although we all have been waiting for this launch for what seems like forever now, I do have one request for AMD. Please never do a major CPU launch and a major GPU launch on the same day ever again, even if it's 7.7 and that that is so clever and perfect because they're both built on the 7 nanometer process. I need sleep! And yes, I will have a Radeon RX 5700 and 5700 XT review up in a few hours as well, so subscribe to my channel if you're not already. Excellent! Cooler Master's SF Series fans feature addressable RGB LEDs and a square design to maximize fan mount coverage and generate high pressure airflow. Available in standard 120mm size as the SF120P, as well as the dual fan 240mm option in the SF240P ARGB. Cooler Master has integrated multiple layers of noise reduction technology and an optimized fan blade design into this series, so click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. They are socket AM4. They're based on 7 nanometers N2 architecture. Those are the important points for today. I'm not gonna rehash any of the gritty details because we've been discussing these for months, to be honest. Instead, I'm gonna be getting right to the benchmarks, starting with the setup. I configured two test beds, one for AMD and one for Intel, and I tried to keep minimal variance between the two setups. Both rigs are open test beds and run the same memory, CPU cooler, and graphics card. The memory is a 16 gig, two by eight gig kit of G-Skill Trident Z Royal RGB, running at 36 MHz and cast latency 16. CPU cooler is the new Noctua NHU-12A tower cooler, which is on the expensive side for an air cooler, but it allowed me to test temperatures between each CPU. And the graphics card is the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 2080 Ti, running with the out-of-the-box manufacturer overclock. The AMD testbed was based on the Gigabyte X570 Aorus master motherboard running UEFI version F5E, which includes AMD Agisa CPU microcode version 1.0.03AB. Windows 10 version 1903 is installed on a 512 gig Samsung 970 Pro M.2 NVMe SSD. And for Go Juice, we have a Cooler Master MWE 1200 watt platinum power supply. The Intel testbed is based on the ASRock Z390 Tai Chi Ultimate motherboard with the same Noctua NHU12A tower cooler. That same 16 gig kit of G-Skill Royal 3600 speed memory and the ASUS RTX 2080 Ti. For storage, there's another 512 gig Samsung 970 Pro M.2 NVMe SSD, and the power supply is an EVGA Supernova G3 750 watt unit. For comparison, I have five CPUs total. Intel is represented by their two most recent flagship parts, the eight core 16 thread Core i9 9900K and the six core 12 thread Core i7 8700K, which cost $490 and $360 respectively as of the time of filming. These are both based on Intel's most recent 14 nanometer CPU microarchitecture. On the AMD side, we of course have the new eight core 16 thread Ryzen 7 3700X and the 12 core 24 thread Ryzen 9 3900X. And I'm also gonna be including the Ryzen in 2000 series flagship, the 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 2700X, which is based on 12 nanometer Zen Plus architecture, as opposed to the 7 nanometer Zen 2 architecture that the Ryzen 3000 series is based on. And now some benchmarks. I wanna start off by talking about frequencies, power draw, and temperatures, because I think that's a big part of the story here. All the CPUs are running at stock speeds with XMP enabled, but no MCE or multi-core enhancement or the relative equivalent of that on the AMD side. All the CPUs can adjust their frequency on the floor depending on load and temperature. So I wanted to show the peak frequency that a core or two might hit and the sustained frequency during an IDA 64 stability test. The 9900K has a peak turbo of five gigahertz and the 8700K goes up to 4.7 gigahertz. Under load though, the 9900K hits 4.7 gigahertz across all cores and the 8700K does 4.3 gigahertz. Of course, all these chips could be overclocked, but I'm sticking with stock settings for this video. Meanwhile, the 2700X hits 4.35 gigahertz max and just under four gigahertz sustained across all cores. Well, the 3700X got just a bit higher to 4.375 gigahertz while also showing off the best sustained all core frequencies in my testing at 4.325 gigahertz. Finally, the 3900X hit over 4.5 gigahertz, 4.525 on a couple cores to be specific, but that dropped off pretty quickly down to 4.05 gigahertz sustained during the stress test. I also measured temperatures during the burn in, both average and maximum, as you can see here. These can be compared since I was using the same cooler in all tests with minimal 
thermal variance in ambient temperature. The excellent Noctua NHU-12A did a great job keeping these cool, even the 9900K, which is still a hot chip, even at stock, with a 101 degrees Celsius max temperature and a more reasonable 80.5 degrees Celsius on average. The 3900X is only a degree cooler on average, but did not peak nearly as hot, which is impressive since it does have 50% more cores, 12 versus 18. The 3700X though, with more cores and a higher sustained frequency than the 8700K, absolutely wins this test with a 71.2C average temperature, and it never got above 80. Power draw is the other side of the efficiency discussion, and I measured full system draw during a Blender CPU render test. I was actually blown away by this comparison. Just 161 watts on average for the 3700X. That is 50 watts less than the second gen 2700X, and that's more than 80 watts less than the 8700K, and literally half the power draw of the 9900K. They're both eight core 16 thread parts, by the way. Wow, AMD, like, wow. The 12 core 3900X comes in with less draw than the 8700K or the 9900K as well. Again, six and eight core parts compared to a 12 core. And that's just very, very nice as well. Let's move into our performance tests. We're gonna start with some CPU benchmarks and then we'll do some gaming benchmarks, starting with Cinebench R20. And here we can see the 3900X dominating everyone else, over 7,000. I'm gonna be using it as a point of comparison from here on out. The 3700X and 9900K both scored uh, just shy of 4,900. 2700X coming in just over 4,000 and 3404 for the 8700K. The Cinebench single thread test is where AMD has suffered in the past, and you can see that represented by the 2700X's score of 438, but the 3900X and 3700X both scored over 500 in this test, while the 9900K and 8700K scored 485 and 479, respectively. That is a small win, but a win nonetheless for the Ryzen 3000 series, uh, scoring about 3 or 5% respectively better than the 9900K and 8700K. Next is CPU Mark, a CPU focused test that's part of the Pass Mark performance suite. Uh, here we have an overall score of 30,000, actually over 30,000 for the 3900X. Compare that to the 9900K score of just under 20,000. That's more than 10,000 points higher, although it does scale with the core and thread count of the two CPUs. The 3900X is about 36% faster than the 9900K and about 47% faster than the 8700K. Moving over to the single thread test and the 2700X again is representing where we're coming from here with a score of 2285. Meanwhile, the 3900X and 3700X are scoring much closer to about 2900. Here again, the single thread tests seem to be on par or even a little bit better with the Ryzen 3000 series, but um, based on the rest of my tests, I think this is because these are shorter tests and the Ryzen CPUs are actually hitting higher frequencies. As my earlier tests already showed, under sustained load, we're not gonna be hitting as quite as high frequencies with the Ryzen CPUs, and that will be borne out as we move into the game testing. But before that, let's move on to Blender. First is a fishy cat render, and this is just time in seconds, so remember a lower score is better here. The 3900X wins once again with a 22.1 second time. The slowest was the 8700K with 30.9 seconds. Still, the 9900K was about 9.5% slower, 8700K was about 40% slower as compared to the 3900X. Next up is the BMW 27 render, which takes quite a bit longer. The 3900X here came in at 161 seconds, which is very fast, over 35% faster than the 9900K, almost 100% faster than the 8700K, and 65% faster than the 2700X. Let's look at some production performance next. We're using the Adobe Premiere Media Encoder to encode about a three minute 4K H.264 video, 40 megabits per second, and we're just showing comparative time in seconds here once again. So lower is better. 3900X wins with 270 seconds. 3700X is about 4.5% slower. 2700X is about 9.2% slower. 9900K and 8700K about 15 and 25% slower. I then took that same three minute video, brought it into hand break and took it from 4K down to 1080 or 1080, 30 frames per second using their fast preset. Here we're listing the time in seconds and also the encoding speed in frames per second. So the time slower is better for encoding speed, the higher number is better. We had 60 frames per second for the 3900X. That was definitely the fastest, about 18% faster than the 3700X and about 21% faster than the 9900K. 
Next up is V-Ray version 4.10.07. This is a ray tracing software suite that uh, runs the tests and outputs a result in case samples. We can see the 3900X just shy of 20,000 with a score of 19,727. Compare that to the 8700K all the way down there at 10,400. 2700X gets a bit better to 12,205. The 3900X was over 30% faster than the 3700X and about 25% faster than the 9900K here. And our final CPU benchmark is Corona 1.0. 1.3. This again is measuring time in seconds, so lower is better. 3900X finished in 73 seconds. Compare that to the 9900K's 97 seconds, which is about 33% slower. Next up, we have a few game tests to try to suss out some relative game performance. First off, the 3 d Mark Firestrike Ultra Synthetic Test. This is a high resolution test, gives an overall score as well as graphics and physics. The graphics test might give us an indication of relative performance between these CPUs with the same graphics card, but honestly, there was less than 1% difference between all of these scores, so not too much to say there. The physics score gives us a bit more of a story of the actual overall performance of each CPU, with the 3900X coming in with a score over 20 8,000 compared to the 9900Ks just shy of 24,000. The 9900K is about 16% slower here, and the 8700K is about 35% slower. Next up is 3D Mark Time Spy. This is a DirectX 12 test. Again, the overall scores are fairly similar here. Graphic scores, once again, also really similar, only about a percentage point difference between them. Although the 9900K and the 8700K were just a little bit faster in the graphics department. CPU test, though, again, is going to show us more of a raw score about CPU performance. And here, the 3900X wins once again with the score of 11,700. 9900K did break 10,000, got close to 11,000, but it was still about 7.2% slower. And now a couple actual game tests running at 1920 by 1080, and if history is any indicator here, the 9900K should be just a bit faster at a lower resolution, 1920 by 1080, than its Ryzen counterparts. And that was the case, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider in DirectX 12 mode was the largest gap I saw when it comes to the 9900K beating the uh, 3900X, 17.8% faster, with a frame rate of 149.7 as compared to the 3900X's 127.1. And then our final test here is Grand Theft Auto V, DirectX 11, still running at 1920 by 1080. And here we see a similar story once again when it comes to gaming, which is that the 9900K does still seem to have a little bit of an edge with 164 average frames per second overall, just barely beating out the 3900X with 158 frames per second. That is about 3.8% faster for the 9900K. 8700K was not quite able to beat it though. It was actually about 4% slower. But again, we have to keep in mind that the 8700K is running at about 400 megahertz slower than the 9900K here. I'm pretty confident that if you took the 8700K, ramped up the clock speed to be equivalent with the 9900K, we'd see the same performance here as well. So finally here we have some overall slides just mashing together all of the data I have accumulated to give you some semblance of, I guess, closure is what we're really looking for here. But I'm using the 3900X as the 100% base Line and then showing the relative performance of all the other CPUs. And here we can see the 3700X just barely beats out the 9900K with about 17 to 18% less performance overall than the 3900X. 2700X, meanwhile, comes in at 71.5%. 8700K takes up the rear with 65.7. As for gaming performance, I did not run a ton of gaming tests, so we're only really looking at four tests combined together here, so bear that in mind. But with the 3900X as the 100% baseline, the 8700K and 9900K actually did demonstrate a bit of increased gaming performance. 9900K in particular, about 5.8% better than the 3900X, although that's mainly because of the shadow of the Tomb Raider score. Meanwhile, the 3700X is just a couple percentage points behind, and the 2700X is 7% slower. Finally, here's a slide comparing both of those performance metrics with the price of each card. So 360 for the 8700K and 490 for the 9900K. I'm going with current prices for the readily available CPUs that are already out. And then of course the launch prices for the 3700X and 3900X. If I had to sum up this slide, I would say that the gaming numbers all look very, very similar, minus the 2700X, while the compute performance scores show a clear lead for AMD. So conclusions now. 
I am impressed. Uh, AMD has absolutely hyped up products in the past that have fallen flat, but I am very happy to say that that is not the case with the Ryzen 3000 series, at least not these two CPUs that I have here. Intel's argument since first gen Ryzen launched has always been about their single core performance, and there definitely is still a little bit of an edge for Team Blue there, especially when it comes to gaming, but it has shrunk down so much that it is instantly offset by everything else. The raw compute performance, the value you get when it comes to the core and thread count compared to Intel and the stunning increases in power efficiency that Intel just does not have an answer for right now. Combine that with a platform that has come into its own with a wide array of full featured motherboards available and the previously unmentioned in this video upgrade to PCI Express Gen 4 this time around, which I just kind of left this little bonus cherry on the cake. And well, I see this as an absolute win for AMD. I don't know how else to put it. I really hope you guys have enjoyed this video though. I will put links to as much stuff as I can that I've shown off here today down in the video's description. And one more reminder that there is another benchmark laden video on the Radeon RX 5700 and 5700 XT coming to you in just a few hours. So subscribe if you wanna see that. Hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you enjoyed this video and thought it was good. And we'll see you guys in the next one.